All right. Well, honestly, so excited for this weekend and to see you all here and to see so many students getting engaged has been phenomenal. We've had over 1400 signups, over 60 universities represented from over 80 countries from across the globe, but enough from me. But one last thing before we kick off, don't be afraid to ask questions throughout. There should be some time at the end for Colonel Wheelock to respond. Feel free to put your name in university or alternatively leave this blank. Our opening keynote speaker, he needs no introduction with a total of 178 days accumulated in space aboard the International Space Station, where he was even commander of the 25th expedition. He's currently chairing the joint test panel for the Lunar Lander project, part of the Artemis program, which is NASA's return to the moon. Without further ado, I couldn't be more happy to hand over to Colonel Wheelock to kick off our inaugural conference. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Will. Hopefully you could hear me. Um, it's great to be joining you. Uh, thanks for the invite and uh, welcome to everyone around the world, really. I, I'm coming to you from Houston, Texas, which is home of uh, NASA's Johnson Space Center, which is um, the, the home and workplace of uh, NASA's astronaut corps as well. So all of our astronauts live and live and train here in Houston. And we, of course, uh, uh, go to the Cape in Florida to launch and or over to, to Kazakhstan with our Russian partners uh, to launch as well into space. And uh, and of course, we've got uh, we've got uh, many of our colleagues that are in seven of our colleagues, in fact, in space right now, orbiting on the International Space Station. And uh, hello from them uh, as well uh, to this group. And um, it's a real pleasure to be with you. I'm going to share. I, I don't have a speech, so um, so I don't have really have like a, a traditional keynote uh, address, if you will. Um, I just want to share with you some things that I've learned in my engineering career, um, you know, starting out as a just a regular kid from a very small town um, out in the country. Uh, but I had a curious mind, and I, and that was a that was the starting point for me, in engineering, and and in flight. Really, you know, I initially, when I was a young boy, I thought about um, what I could do in my place, and and because I was from a small school and a small town, um, I felt very ordinary, and um, it was years later when I um, when I was selected as an astronaut. I got a chance to meet Neil Armstrong for the first time in my life. And I remembered, I was a little boy, I probably much older than those listening in, but um, I was a little boy when we first put people on the moon. And so I remember watching that on a small black and white TV. And um, it was years later when I arrived at NASA, I uh, I got a chance to meet Neil Armstrong and I was terrified. <laughs> and so I, you know, my, my knees were shaking because I, I thought, you know, um, what an incredible experience. I was sort of pinching myself. Is this really for real? Because I still looked at myself and viewed myself as an ordinary kid from an ordinary place, you know. And um, I got a chance to ask him my question, you know. So, and I didn't know what to ask Neil. What do you ask Neil Armstrong, you know? So I remember that night at dinner, I sat at the table with him and I wanted to know how he felt you know, as an extraordinary, like a superhero, right? So um, at least he was in my childhood, you know, and for all of us, really, he was the pioneer, you know, that first put a boot on the surface of the moon. And, uh, but I wanted to sort of understand how he felt as this extraordinary superhero. And I, I asked him, I said, Mr. Armstrong, when you're there on the moon, um, could you just for a moment, um, think about what a profound moment it was in human history and how things were never going to be the same after that. You know, we we always hear these, you know, whenever we run into a difficult thing, especially in engineering, you know, we always have this uh, sort of joke that's like, you know, we could put a person on the moon, but we can't do and then fill in the blank, you know, so. Um, and so I wanted to know how he felt as a superhuman. And I and I asked him that he said, you know, I thought about he said, I stuck my thumb out and I covered up what I could see of the earth, you know, everybody that ever lived, you know, all the people I knew, all my loved ones, my f friends and family were all there in that little blue dot. And um, 
and he said, you know, I thought about the the folks that built the rocket and I thought about how much I missed home and missed my family. But I also thought to myself, how does a young boy, an ordinary kid from Wapakoneta, Ohio, end up standing on the moon? And he sort of chuckled a little bit and we all laughed. And I thought, hey, wait a second, that's that's my story. You know, it's like that's and it's the, it's really the story for all of us. Regardless of where we are, where we're sitting right now, uh, what what country, what village, what what big city uh, you're sitting in, we're all really ordinary kids from ordinary places with these extraordinary dreams for our life, and um, and hoping and setting our goals and setting our aspirations that our life, our ordinary life, will with our curious mind and our insatiable. Uh, imagination to that our ordinary life can intersect with the extraordinary. And that's really what it's all about in engineering. And I, I, I'm ashamed to say that I went so many years uh, without really realizing that, you know, I, I thought that doing things like this, like, you know, putting on a blue suit and flying in space and or flying airplanes even, I thought those things were reserved for people with extraordinary skills or extraordinary extraordinary uh, schools that they come from and things like that, but not true. It's really what's resident here, you know, in your heart, in your mind, in your curio your own curiosity, where it can take you uh, because it can propel an ordinary life into an extraordinary circumstances. And so um, I wanted to share a little bit of my story. I'm gonna bring up my screen here. Um, you'll still hear me, hear me talk, but I wanted to share some some uh, interesting pictures from space and some some video as well that I took and just kind of share my story um, because I I have the feeling that it's a lot like your story. And so um, I come from ordinary beginnings and um, probably much like everybody tuning in. So this is actually me on my on the final my sixth spacewalk uh, to repair the International Space Station. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the title, I put the title of my talk is Chance Favors the Prepared Mind, because I remember when I first, I, I was just dreamed of flight when I was a young boy, and I just wanted to fly. And I hadn't flown anything up until the point where I I was was going into college. And so, uh, and so I remember getting to flight school thinking to myself, uh, thinking to myself, gosh, I hope I, I hope I like this, you know, I hope, uh, I hope I like uh, flying, uh, flying machinery, because it's certainly uh, where I placed my, my hopes and dreams. And so um, this was uh, sort of the pinnacle of my, um, my space walking career. And you can see the, um, you can see the, uh, the reflection of the Earth's uh, uh, blue, uh, striking blue um, explosion of colors in my visor there. And um, it had me, it gave me a chance to kind of reflect back on on my journey as an as an engineer, and 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 as a pilot and as an astronaut. And so, this is that image that really changed my life when I was a young boy. You, you probably recognize this. We call this Earthrise, and it was it was taken by the Apollo 8 crew in December of 1968. And when they sent this picture back to the Earth, it really changed all of us because. There's our home, our blue planet, just sort of hanging in the balance. And, um, and I remember as a little boy seeing this image and thinking to myself, it's like, wow, this is, I wanna go there one day. I wanna go back to the, I wanna go out to the moon. I wanna explore the stars. And, and then I kind of honed in on our, our planet and thinking about how fragile it is uh, of a place it is. And this is the image uh, essentially the image that Neil Armstrong was talking about when he, he stuck his thumb out at arm's length. And you could try that on your screen as well and just cover up what you see of the earth. And it, it makes you, you know, he was asked, um, you know, Mr. Armstrong, did it make you feel really like, you know, big and powerful? He goes, no, it made me feel really small. And um, and gosh, how I missed home, our beautiful um, uh, blue planet. And so um, it was my chance to go off to, um, uh, to flight school, and um, this is uh, this is not me in flight school, but um, this is of course the uh, a picture of the very first flight um, of a powered aircraft. Um, this is the only the this is the one and only picture 
of that very first flight of the Wright brothers um, at Kitty Hawk in, in North Carolina. And, um, and this really, this image actually is what got me interested in, and the story behind this image got me interested um, in my first um, thoughts of flight. And when I went off to flight school, when I went off to flight school, I, uh, I started learning to fly in helicopters, um, obviously much different than airplanes. Um, and uh, you get your feet going, you get your hands going, and uh, and it's and your head on a swivel. We we used to say, uh, to, so you can see 360 around you. And um, and my first flight instructor, uh, he would he would he was trying to teach me how to hover. And um, if there if there are helicopter pilots listening in, you may chuckle a little bit because you'll remember the days when you first started to try to hover. And we my introduction to PIO, the pilot induced oscillations, and uh, as I as I was trying to hover this craft, and my I, I was I had white knuckles on the controls and sweating bullets, we say, and um, my my flight instructor was sitting over there beside me. He said, "What are you doing?" And I said, "I'm trying to I'm trying to hover." And he goes, "This is how you hover." And he put he put one finger on each of the controls and one foot on two pedals, and brought it to a perfect hover. And he goes he goes okay. He said, the first lesson you need to learn in engineering and flight is that chance favors the prepared mind. And I thought, what are you talking about? He's quoting poetry to me, you know? And um, I thought it was Keats because he used to he used to quote me Keats uh, poetry. Uh, but this actually, chance favors the prepared mind actually came from Louis Pasteur and uh, in the, in the, um, in the, um, uh, the age old battle in, in the scientific method and, and in, in the search of discovery that chance favors the prepared mind. And so, so his lesson to me that day um, was something that I took all the way through my career. It's like, it's like you know, the, the, we, we live uh, in a, a life uh, like covered with chances, opportunities that come along. And his point was, when those opportunities come along, good and bad, that you're ready, you're prepared, uh, because you've practiced and you've you've already projected in your mind how you're going to how you're going to react to those both good opportunities and wonderful uh, amazing opportunities that come along, and also the failures that come along when you're in the field of engineering, because the failures come often as they do in flight, and um, and as you begin to lift off the ground or you're in a laboratory with uh, with um, with materials that are um, that are fairly dangerous to um, to normal human life um, you begin to you know those those um, those gains begin to be, uh, be ratcheted up and um, and you need to always have a prepared mind uh, that you're ready for those failures to meet them head on and so when I was in flight school, that was my first lesson that I learned, and then I, and then the also, also he looked at me after that first flight, and he said, "You know, we're all explorers," and so I'm going to share this uh, video with you with a little bit of uh, some uh, some nostalgia in here and kind of where we're going uh, as a spacefaring people. Roger the pitch. Seven. Five. Roger, Four. Roger. You're looking good. Three. We are the explorers. We have a need to find what is out there. It is a drive inside each and every one of us. The drive to wonder, to push the boundaries, and to explore. We expanded across our lands, settling new frontiers. We took to the oceans and learned that we could cross treacherous expanses in the pursuit of discovery. And then we took to the skies and flew. But that wasn't enough. We left the planet and redefined what was possible. We flew in space. We walked in space. What once was a melodramatic flight of fantasy became reality. Then, a new generation of spaceships captured hearts and minds for three decades and helped build a castle in the sky that is our lasting home in space. We have always looked up, 
For centuries, we wondered what was on the other side of the sky, and we have begun to answer that question. We have learned that all the exploration humankind has achieved is only a beginning. Right now, men and women are working on the next steps to go farther than we have ever gone before. New vessels will carry us, and new destinations await us. Everything we have ever accomplished leads to this moment in time, where exploration will now take us to the planets and the stars. Our nearest neighbors in the night sky have beckoned us, invited us, dared us to reach for them. We are the explorers. Throughout our history, we have taken both small steps and giant leaps in that pursuit. Our next destination awaits. We don't know what new discoveries lie ahead, but this is the very reason we must go. We start out our as we as we're training to get ready for a um, a space mission. We um, we fall back on that chance favoring the prepared mind, and we begin our preparation. And um, you know, I I cut a kid that I, I showed up at NASA. I got my blue flight suit. And I said, "Where's my rocket? I'm ready to go." You know, but uh, what I didn't know is like how much you uh, all of us need to learn about ourselves, not only self awareness but situational awareness as well. And so we begin our training to go to the stars at NASA. We begin out in, uh, out, out in the outdoors and being able to survive um, in a stressful situation. And so this is, a, this is that's me in the middle with a, uh, with a brown uh, sweatshirt on and some of my crewmates. And um, uh, down on the uh, lane on the ground there is, you might recognize that's Max Sarayev, who is a, a Russian cosmonaut. And uh, so in this image, um, actually on the very far left, um, you'll see um, Megan Benkin, and she's actually on the space station right now as a long duration crew member. And so um, uh, so a lot of us were out there in the wilderness uh, to begin our training and begin our preparation, pre preparing our bodies and preparing our minds for, uh, for the adventure. Um, I then took, uh, we went into what we call NEMO at NASA, which is uh, NASA Extreme Environments Mission Operations. And so this was uh, uh, 10 days at the bottom of the sea in a habitat that's anchored to the bottom of the ocean. And so about uh, 65 feet, uh, 70 feet depth um, off of the Florida Keys. It's called Aquarius. And we, um, we lived down there for 10 days and um, we did uh, simulated spacewalks and we also um, it was a 10-day simulation as well where we um, introduced failures in our systems uh, so we can uh, be able to deal with um, with failures one of the one of the things I wanted to leave you today uh, as you're as you're whether you're just beginning your engineering career or you're just beginning your journey into engineering um, the is to not be afraid of failure uh, because we're human um, and um, none of us have a lock on, uh, on uh, uh, solutions to everything that we're working with, uh, including the machinery that we're building. And so, so to, be, to keep a curious mind and to be able to uh, embrace failure and, uh, and understand that failure uh, of a process or failure of an activity uh, that you're doing is a is a learning opportunity, and so we we um, design, test, fail, and then repeat, and we keep going back, redesign, retest, you know, see what other failures are out there. In fact, NASA was the the first place I ended up working at that we practiced failure every day that we're in simulation. We practice failure, uh, which is which is hard for us as humans because it's probably one of our greatest fears, right? Is to uh, is the fear of failing because we don't want to fail. It, it's not it's not fun to fail. Um, but I'm here to tell you that um, if if greatness in your chosen profession is something that you seek, uh, something that's a goal of yours to be excellent and to achieve greatness in your line of work, 
failure is an integral part of that. And so you have, if you avoid failure, you will never reach, I'm here to tell you that you'll never reach the level of greatness that you see for your life, that you envision for your life. And so to be open to and be ready that your mind is prepared, that your body is prepared, and um, and that your teamwork, the, the teamwork that you build um, through your studies and through your work together, um, you can meet those challenges, meet those failures uh, with redesign and re uh, reimagination of um, of your goals and dreams. Um, all of this preparation took nine years for me. It was nine years from the point that I uh, pinned on astronaut wings till I got a chance to fly in space. And so now looking back, I, th I thought to myself, uh, gosh, what a what a journey, you know, but it's it's true for really any when you want to be at the top of your game in your chosen profession or your cho chosen discipline, uh, that it does take a lot of hard work. And then all along the way, there are there are peaks and valleys of uh, of your journey as well. And so my time came in 2007. This is the space shuttle discovery. I remember when I was probably a lot of folks listening in are engineering students. And when I was a, when I was a, a just a, a, in the latter parts of my high school years and just trying to determine what I wanted to do when I grow up, I, I decided that engineering and flight was, was what I wanted to do. And so, and then out comes this, uh, this spaceship with wings, the space shuttle. And I thought like, wow, it's like a collision of, uh, of, uh, of my dream of flight and my dream of, flying to space and here we have a spaceship with wings and so I got my opportunity in 2007. This is the space shuttle discovery on my mission. Um, uh, this was eye-opening experience on the launch. Um, I was, it was quite dramatic. It was, um, uh, you can see for all you aero engineers out there, um, you know, the shuttle is sitting on an ex external tank and it's got those two solid rocket boosters on the side there. A lot of power uh, coming out of this thing and the roll axis is that big orange tank. So you can see the pointy end of that. That's your roll axis and look at where you're sitting on the space shuttle. It's about 20 feet, uh, uh, about a 20, 25 foot moment arm from where you're sitting in the cockpit of the shuttle to the roll axis. So it looks very smooth on TV, you know, when you or when you're watching it in person, it rolls on its back. Uh, but when you're inside, you feel like you're on the end of a merry-go-round and uh, being slung around, you know, uh, with this with this uh, moment arm from the roll axis. And so it was it was eye watering uh, for me. And so and, and I thought to myself as a test pilot, I thought, how did I not realize this, that this is what it was going to feel like? So so th enjoy. This is the. Um, the first minute of the launch of the space shuttle discovery. T minus 16 seconds, sound suppression water system has been activated, protecting discovery in the launch pad from acoustical energy. We have a go for main engine start. T minus five, four, three, two, one. Booster ignition and liftoff of discovery, hoisting harmony to the heavens and opening new gateways for international science. Discovery has cleared the tower. Houston now controlling. Roll program. Roger roll, Discovery. Discovery's roll maneuver is complete. It's now in a head down position on track for its flight to the International Space Station. Discovery seven miles downrange at an altitude of two statute miles. Flying at 600 miles per hour. Discovery's engines are throttling down as the orbiter passes through the area of maximum pressure on the vehicle. Now 50 seconds into the flight. I just couldn't wait to uh, to get to space. The first, so the first thing I did was, of course, it was we it only takes about eight and a half minutes to get to space in the space shuttle it was uh we just jumped off that pad eight and a half minutes later we were traveling at five miles per second which is eight kilometers per second um, in orbital velocity uh docked with the space station and looking out the window i just i was 
just sort of awestruck at our earth um, because looking at it hanging in the balance was just um, and seeing that thin blue line of our atmosphere, I thought to myself, wow, what a what an amazing blue planet. I, I remember dreaming as a kid, um, you know, I dreamed about traveling out to the stars. I used to build like little spaceships out of cardboard boxes and everything, you know, and dream about living on another planet, like tra traveling to Mars or even traveling to Pluto. Uh, when I was a young boy, of course, Pluto was just a, even with the most powerful telescopes um, in the sky, it was still just a fuzzy faint dot. But I dreamed about, you know, living on Pluto. And I thought to myself, once I got to space, like within the first couple of minutes, um, uh, I don't know if it was my life flashing before my eyes or what have you, uh, but uh, I looked out and I thought to myself, you know, I remember how vivid my dreams were of uh, being on another planet or living or traveling to another planet. And um, I thought to myself, gosh, had I been a little kid like on Mars or on Pluto or some other planet and could look out in the night sky with a telescope and see this blue planet, you know, out there, just an explosion of color like in the sunlight um, and then in darkness i'll show you some uh, some images of the earth in darkness it's just a it's a raging ball of light and motion at night as well how i remember how vivid my dreams were as a little boy and i thought to myself gosh had i been able to look out in the night sky and see this place our planet um, how much more vivid my dreams would be to go to say to myself i'd I'd love to travel to that planet, you know, planet Earth. Um, then I took a picture of my hometown. Um, you can't see it there, but I sure can. And so this is the east coast of the U.S., the northeast coast of the U.S., um, and it's sort of looking south southwest, um, or west southwest. And um, you can see Cape Cod, uh, the city of Boston and Massachusetts. You can see uh, um, Long Island and New York City. And then as you go up uh, into the upstate, uh, uh, kind of the highlands of New York, um, my little town rests up there in the forest. And so uh, uh, this image is very dear to me, but it, you can see the, um, uh, the striking uh, colors of our, of our planet. And then um, this is image, it looks sort of like a, uh, an impressionist painting or something. This is actually, the Great Barrier Reef off the coast, the east coast of Australia. And a lot of our science we are doing on board the station, uh, the space station is, is looking at our coral reefs and much of what we're doing or pretty much all of what we're doing um, in space in the way of science is, um, is to help take better care of ourselves, take better care of each other and take better care of our planet as well. So I'm, I'm not one of these, I, uh, proponents that we need to go to Mars because we need another to find another place to propagate the human species. Um, because my my reaction to that is like it's a it's a wonderful uh, thought to travel and explore Mars, uh, but to do it because we we ruined our planet is uh, you know as if we would take better care of Mars when we get there than we take care of our own planet, right? So so uh, but our planet is just so beautiful. Um, in the sunlight, of course, we're orbiting the Earth. And so we, we orbit the Earth uh, once every 90 minutes. And so every 45 minutes, we get either a sunrise or a sunset in Earth orbit. And so, um, uh, and each one just spectacularly beautiful. And so we get 16 sunrises and 16 sunsets every 24 hour day in space in Earth orbit. And so it's pretty magical. And of course, um, you can see the sharp contrast of, um, uh, you know, we we kind of quip that we don't, uh, you know, when you're on looking at the Earth from space, you don't see borders, and it's true, you don't really see man-made borders, you know, but you sure can see where the water is, you know. So this is, uh, this is of course, the Nile River snaking up through the Great Sahara Desert, which is just amazing. You can see how we we flock to where the water sources are, you know, which is which makes sense, right? So, so, uh, but the sharp contrast of um, of landforms uh, from space, which is quite amazing. So, I dreamed about, you know, I I, I thought that this is what I was going to be doing for six months on the space station, and um, you know, taking pictures out these windows, and we have beautiful windows that we uh, can look out. But um, 
But this is what I was actually doing most of the time was fixing broken parts, which, you know, us engineers, we love to uh, tinker with things and figure out how things work and how to make them work better, right? So, so, um, so this was a lesson learned um, uh, in teamwork as well. That, so there are some less glamorous um, jobs on the space station, and this is me fixing the potty the toilet or the loo, however you want to refer to it as. Um, this is the inner workings of the space toilet in space. Um, I was uh, I was doing some science one day and I was I'm not a scientist and I'm an engineer and so I was doing my my glove box science and uh, I flew with two brilliant women PhD scientists, uh, Shannon Walker and Tracy Caldwell Dyson and and um, I always thought to myself as I was doing my science, as like, I wish Tracy were doing this, or I wish Shannon were doing this. And one day, uh, Shannon came to me. She said, "Hey, wheels, the potty's broken." I was like, "Well, we got to fix the potty. We're on a spaceship, you know." So um, we got. She said, "If you fix the potty, I'll do all of your science for the rest of the day." And so I said, "That's a deal." So we sort of did the zero g floating high five, you know. And um, I went off and. Uh, and fix the potty. It took me about 90 minutes to fix this potty. Um, but I found out in those 90 minutes, if you're on a spaceship, you know, trapped with your with your uh, crewmates on a spaceship and, the, and you can fix the potty, you are essentially guardian of the galaxy on this, uh, on these missions. And so, um, and so it, it kind of harkened back to my, um, you know, I, I sort of jokingly said, you know, that, and, and then I got a chance to do six spacewalks as well, uh, which was amazing. And when I, when I was training to do my spacewalks, I dreamed that this is what I would be doing, you know, taking these selfies, you know, with me against the earth. And, um, but this is really what I was doing. And you can see, you can see the uh, torn solar array there at the bottom left corner of the screen. Um, we deployed this solar array and it, it, it actually one of the guide wires got frayed and started unzipping this array, and um, and so I I discovered right away that in this in this um, business of space travel and space exploration, much like the engineering field that you're in, I mean your your quest is to make figure out how things work and how to make them work better and how to discover new things to make to uh, take uh, better care of ourselves, take better care of each other, and also take better care of our planet. We're doing the same thing in space. And um, and so this was quite an adventure, uh, but one of the lessons that I had um, in, in teamwork that I wanna leave with you today as well. So you're gonna find yourself as a member of a team. You probably, hopefully have already found that in your schooling and in your um, engineering work that you're it's never really a Lone Ranger kind of project, right? You're always sort of with a team, kind of drawing off the strengths of the, like a multidisciplinary team. We do the very same thing in space, and um, and uh, which leads me to this next image, which taught me a life lesson that I, that this is actually not me. I'm actually taking the picture. Um, I was down at the bottom of the solar array and my buddy, um, Scott Perizinski, was on the end of this arm uh, because he had longer arms than I do. And um, so he could reach, uh, this was just at the t at the uh, uh, the height of his reach, um, and it would have been out of reach for me. And I thought to myself, I should get a picture of Scott, right? So I, I said, hey, Scott, look down here and wave. And then, so I snapped this picture, and this picture ended up, you, those of you who study aviation, uh, or or flight uh, and and us as astronauts, we there's a publication called Aviation Week and Space Technology. We call it a Av Week. It's a periodical that comes out monthly, and um, Av Week. So this picture, as as well as others, ended up on the cover of Aviation Week and Space Technology in the in the month we returned uh, uh, from the space station. And Scott came in uh, to our office once we were back on Earth. He said, dude, check it out. I'm on the cover of Av Week. And I looked at this image and I said like, hey, wait a second, I took that picture, you know? And, um, and so I thumbed through to the, uh, you know, the cover photo inside the magazine, you know, and it said, um, Dr. cover photo, Dr. Scott Perzinski, 
in the most daring spacewalk in NASA history, you know, blah, 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 blah. And it said, um, photo courtesy of NASA. And so I kind of chuckled at that, but it was a, it was a wonderful lesson in, that I want to leave with you today as well. In your teams, especially if you're leading a team, if you can bring a team, your team, to the point where um, it doesn't matter who gets the credit uh, for this gr these tremendous achievements, if you can bring your team to that level um, where they can excel to a point where it doesn't matter to them or to you as a team leader um, who gets the credit, then you have reached the pinnacle of teamwork and success. And so I thought to myself, you know, it was sort of a funny that um, uh, Scott was in his glory and I took the picture. I thought, I thought, you know, that's a really good lesson for me that um, it really doesn't matter um, who gets the glory. It's just that the, the strength of the team and being able to pull through um, adversity uh, was the importance that I learned in engineering on that day. Scott and I went on to, this is Scott and I uh, floating in the, uh, in the space shuttle and, um, you know, with our EVA checklist getting ready to, uh, to go out the door. And then it was years later after we got back to Earth, um, we, stayed, we stayed connected with each other and we ended up, this is taking an Everest base camp. And so we, uh, Scott summited, I did not, uh, but I went to the, uh, uh, we spent some time in Everest Base Camp as part of our um, extreme environments uh, mission operations as well to put ourselves into into situations where we have to engage our uh, a problem solving mindset, how to stay calm, and how to deal with uh, with failure and adversity as well. So adversity as well. So then I got my second chance to go into space, and it was on board um, a Russian Soyuz. I don't know if we have any of our uh, Russian colleagues listening in, uh, got a chance to launch um, from Kazakhstan, from the Baikonur Cosmodrome um, on a Russian Soyuz. Um, and I stayed on the space station for six months as the commander in 2010 of the space station. And um, this is the Russian pressure suit. It's called Sokol. This is a Sokol suit. And of course, in Russian, uh, Sokol is the word falcon. Um, that we know as a as a bird um, a bird of prey, uh, a falcon. So the suit is named so Sokol, and I got a chance to ride on this rocket, which is quite a different experience than the space shuttle. Of course, it, the thrust is coming up through your backside, and so there's very little, um, very little uh, of that um, merry-go-round effect, but more of a pogo vibration and and lots of uh, lots of vibration coming on as well. Um, then this is the um, uh, this is the underside or the the uh, the business side of that of that Soyuz rocket. Then we get to the space station, so you can see it's like, gosh, you look really close to the Earth, and we are we're we're in low Earth orbit, Leo as we call it, and so this is kind of our windows on the world, looking out on our planet, um, and uh, some of the images that we can see. Uh, from space. These are, of course, in the middle of the screen are the pyramids in Egypt uh, next to that Nile River, um, uh, Nile River snaking through the Sahara. And so um, you could probably pick those out in the middle of the screen. And then some other things are our Earth in, in, in the sunlight is like this breathtaking explosion of color in this vast empty sea of darkness of, of deep space. And then our planet is just raging with life. You can see this is a volcano erupting and actually um, uh, it's uh, it, it kind of ripped a hole in the in this cloud layer and actually carried these clouds uh, into the stratosphere. And so the, our, our Earth is just a churning with churning with life, life and motion. And um, this is a hurricane um, in the Atlantic uh, from uh, the vantage point of the space station as well. Um, some of the other things that we do are the science we're doing on the space station. Um, if you're interested in uh, uh, material science or any kind of environmental engineering, um, this is the island nation of Madagascar. And uh, we, were, we were growing willow trees in the absence of gravity to see um, if we can help um, engineer the genome of the tree, uh, of the willow tree specifically, because they're fast growing how we can reforest areas that had been deforested. 
and um, and Madagascar was our case study back then, and uh, to to figure out how to make um, optimal use of water resources and minerals in the soil, how to quickly get minerals uh, and and uh, biomass back into the soil, you know, to um, to get our forest um, uh, regrowth and croplands as well. We uh, work with farmers um, uh, how to uh, how to be, uh, better. Uh, grow crops as well in our farmlands. Then the night comes. I mentioned that 45 minutes later, the sun goes down and our planet comes alive with a, as a ball of life. It's just a, a raging ball of life in this uh, vast empty sea. And um, and the uh, the stars that we see, you know, I'll, I'll, um, I'll, I want to show you one video that we put together. This is, of course, is the Milky Way. Uh, I'll give you a, just a little glimpse of um, um, of the uh, our Earth at night, our Earth illuminated. So here we go. And I wanted to open up now uh, to any questions that might come in, uh, uh, questions you have about um, uh, your specific journey in engineering and how uh, um, how you see your your path going as well and your career aspirations and your goals as well. So, wow! Thank you uh, for a phenomenal session. Uh, just uh, it's not over uh, just yet either. We've had a great deal of questions come through. Um, I'm going to go through a few of them. I think picked up on some some common themes themes there. Um, we have Justine from South Africa asks. So you've achieved your lifelong uh, sort of dream of going into space. W what's next for you and how do you continue to what what, what gets you up in the morning? What excites you? Wonderful. Thank you. You said Jean in South Africa. Justine from South Africa. Justine, Justine, thank you, Justine. Great question. Um, had great pictures of uh, of Cape Town and uh, and uh, the African uh, continent. It was just wonderful um, images from space. Um, so what what uh, excites me now? We're we're going back to the moon. And um, one of the other lessons I wanted to um, uh, 
give you today that's something that I learned um, kind of going through my career. It's uh, we're all sort of writing our own story, right? We in, in our story that we're writing of our life, of our journey, our experience in engineering or, or our chosen profession, we are the hero in our own story, which we should be. Uh, we should be living each day of our life as the hero of the story that we're writing of our life, right? So, um, and now I'm beginning to discover the joy and the reward and sort of the, just the excitement of becoming a hero in someone else's story, which is amazing to me because I, I'm sort of at the getting to the tail end of my operational career. And now I'm working with our our early career astronauts and our engineers that are coming along uh, wanting to build new spaceships and new rockets and um, new flying craft, you know, to, I mean, you saw that just recently, just this spring, we landed a craft on the moon and we have a helicopter, I'm sorry, on Mars, and we have a helicopter flying on Mars now, which is just amazing to me. Um, and oh, by the way, on, a, on that little helicopter, there's a, there's a little piece of the Wright Flyer uh, that we sent along as well. So this little helicopter operating on Mars. So when I was a kid or an engineering student coming up, uh, we could say like we we put people on the moon, but we can't do and fill in the blank. Now you could say we have a helicopter on Mars, but we can't do fill in the blank. And so Justine, it's a great question. Um, we are now uh, heading back to the moon. And so I, I've been able to kind of step back from space flight and um, and refocus in the first the first A in NASA. Um, is aeronautics, and so my first love and what brought me to NASA was my my love and interest in flight and um, and in aer aeronautics. And so uh, we are now developing a craft uh, to train people to land on the moon. You probably remember during Apollo, uh, we had the lunar lander training vehicle, the LLTV. You could just Google that or what have you. And it, there's all kinds of great stories and ima imaginative. It was the very first fly-by-wire system uh, that we had um, known to man mankind. And so the, um, and we took that vehicle and we trained, we, we simulated lunar dynamics in a, in a craft flying here on earth to be able to train our, our, our astronauts to land on the moon. And so, we, we're coming on with the Artemis program now, and you may know that in, in Greek mythology, Artemis was the twin sister of Apollo in Greek mythology, and also the goddess of the moon. And so our, our return to the moon, our program is called Artemis because we're, as you remember, it was all men that landed on the moon during Apollo, and we're gonna send the first woman um, and the next man to the surface of the moon here in just a handful of years, and we're very excited about that. And so right now I'm I'm chairing the joint test panel for the lunar lander. So it's exciting work. Um, I Where I started, I went back to the archives, took all the Apollo data, uh, how they built the LLTV uh, vehicle, how they trained to go to the moon, how they simulated lunar dynamics, and I, you know, blew the dust off the cover, metaphorically, of course, and um, and started digging into um, those archives uh, to try to develop using the advances we've had in technology over the last number of decades, being able to use that um, uh, in in a flying craft to help us train to go back to the moon. So great question, Justine, and I, I still, I still inside, I still feel like I'm 18 years old, you know, and just starting out in my engineering career. But that's that's um, one of the really exciting things about engineering, really all all facets of engineering. And if you, when you, you know, in school, we find ourselves, I was an aero engineer uh, mainly. And so I kind of felt a little bit pigeonholed until I got to like the real world where you're working with really with engineering platforms and engineering theory and things. When you find yourself among uh, a multidisciplinary team, and then you can begin to learn how in, how that engineering thread kind of is woven throughout our um, throughout our disciplines, and it's a wonderful team sort of environment as we as we put together 
uh, these new uh, lunar landing craft. So that's my that's my next uh, goal. And all along the way, of course, inside, I wish I were going to, and maybe I'll get a chance to go to the moon. But I, but I know now that um, there is real joy in just uh, being able to contribute uh, to to my particular field of engineering, and to be able to um, help us as a as globally to be able to get back there. So that's my Fantastic. new adventure. Thank you so much. Another question, a sort of recurring theme, but um, Gowry sort of asks, you know, how do you manage self-doubt? And a lot of people asking, how, how do you manage that and sort of staying motivated? And is this the right path for you? Uh, did, did you have a mentor? You know, uh, just keen to, to hear your thoughts on that. Gosh, uh, that's, it's so key. It's a great question because it's, it is the first major brick wall you're going to run into on your on your journey because engineering is difficult it's challenging especially if you're trying to design a new way of doing something you know or or taking uh an old design and trying to make it better or more efficient or safer um you know the the things that we do in engineering um it's really just sort of implementing you know uh so my and how do how do we deal with doubt because I'm human just like you and so all along the way I have a lot of I've run into a lot of self-doubt um, and what I found is um, are, are the, th the things that we can do there's a couple of really basic steps we can do as engineers and engineers in training and and uh, those of us that have goals of becoming an engineer um, is to always keep a curious mind about you um, keep a curious mind, be be curious about what's going on around you. And this not only has to deal, but what's going on in society, what's going around uh, on in technology, you know, just be cognizant of the world around you. You know, it's, it's always good to be self-aware as well, uh, but to be cognizant of what's going on around you because we begin as we get older and we sort of get out there in the world, especially as we're working on teams, um, opportunities where there's need um, and there is a lot of need on our planet and so when you can see you could say like gosh it would be better if we if we did things this way or if we designed something that could fill this basic human need you know um, then uh, when you keep that curious mind about you and then keep an open mind as well so so probably one of the worst things you can do as an engineer is be close-minded um, and be be humble and be authentic and just be like a sponge, you know, to take it all in because you're going to run into differing opinions. And we always have a joke here at, at the astronaut office. If you get five astronauts in a room, you're going to get about 15 opinions, you know, in the, and, and, and how to best do something or how to best uh, engineer something. And so is to just sort of sit back, receive, you know, kind of do your your own triage and problem solving and be, uh, keep an open mind about you. So and when those when those times of self-doubt um, come through, just remember that uh, you're ordinary, I'm ordinary. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to you're trying to prepare to meet the extraordinary opportunity when it comes along. So, so don't get downtrodden by self-doubt, which will will really bring you down pretty quickly. So don't don't um, reside there. You know, like kind of look at what you what what has happened. If it's a failure that's come along in your research or in life, you know, it might not even be engineering. It might be in like a personal life or a family relationship or something like that. Problem solving. Is this is true in those instances as it is in is in engin hardcore engineering when you're actually designing something? So, is to step back and with a problem-solving mindset, clearly lay out what solutions there are, uh, what courses of action, you know, uh, uh, lay them out and how you're gonna how you're gonna overcome the the adversity. So. Um, just be ready for the self-doubt. Understand that everybody faces it, and it's really a part of uh, becoming great 
and becoming excellent in your chosen profession. So um, it really it's a battle and don't let it don't let it take control of you. Uh, but it's uh, you you may face it every day and uh, all of us do, you know, from time to time uh, face these adversities and self doubt. Just uh, just power through it, knowing that you have the skills and your problem solving skills to um, uh, to overcome it. So. That's some great advice there. Thank you. Um, something uh, as well that's come up perhaps uh, related to that Nisha from Bangladesh. Um, you know, she comments upon all the responsibilities that you must have and something Paloma has touched on as well, these big expectations and how you manage how you manage the pressure. I mean, a lot of what you, you've said must tie into that. Yeah, exactly. It's uh, the most important thing is this is this is teamwork. Teamwork is so important and trust, building trust in teams. Um, and there's a couple of key things you can do that I, I found helpful for me is to be authentic, to be authentic in your in your everyday life, you know, be authentic in your personal relationships, in your family relationships, be authentic in your communication, be authentic in your engineering and in your studies. And so and when you do that, when you're when you're real and you and you open up your your the real you to the to the input and output, it, it, it's a much better it. You'll develop as a team member, uh, uh, operational team member, much better, and you'll emerge as a leader in your in your discipline. And um, the other is not only authenticity in your walk, but also humility. Um, you know that it's it it. You need to have an air of humility about you, especially in this business, in the in the business of engineering or science. Um, you need to kind of follow the science, right? I mean, it's like the science is the science, fact is fact. You know, theory is is theory, and um, and so our our goal as as engineers and scientists is to seek seek truth, you know, and to be open minded to other opinions and other thoughts and other processes. And so, you know, much like we we see our lives, you know, um, I, I had a life lesson uh, taught to me uh, from an astronomer that um, he showed me an image of of the uh, or Orion constellation in the heavens um, uh, under from the Hubble Space Telescope. It's beautiful. And uh, and um, you know, he's, he said to me, he said, you see those seven stars? And of course, Betelgeuse is up in the corner. You have the uh, four sort of main corner stars, then the three, the three stars in Orion's belt. Um, and then there's lots of other stars, of course, in that constellation. But he said, you know, of those seven primary stars, that three of those stars are actually closer to us than they are to each other. And I thought to myself, wow. And I, I've never looked at the Orion constellation uh, like 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 that. I mean, it's my what well, now I can see the depth. You know, a million years from now or a thousand years from now, Orion will look different because th those stars, some of them are actually closer to Earth than they are to each other. So, but we see it when we look in the night sky. We see it as a two-dimensional. Um, you know, uh, constellation, right? And so we can see it and we, it's easy to pick out and um, in the night sky. And, um, uh, but, but when we think about the depth that's there and we have to think those very same things about our own life, you know, we have to look at our own goals and dreams. We have to look at it in three dimension to understand that there's depth there too. There's not just this way, that way, this way, that way. Um, but there's also depth in our journey as well, and to be to, to realize through humility that we don't we don't quite understand all that we need to know to be excellent in our field, and so keep an open mind to learn those things. Fantastic. If I could just ask one last very quick question to to round up the session, what sort of one piece of advice would you give your younger self if they were attending this session just today? You know, I, um, I I went back. I want to go back to one of the things I, I first learned um, coming here to NASA was that um, relax about the ordinary, you know, celebrate the ordinary in your life, because I came up 
and to the point where I met Neil Armstrong, I'd come through years of engineering, years of schooling, uh, years of flight training to end up at NASA with a blue suit on. And it, it took me all those years to realize that I'm human, you're human, Neil Armstrong is human. We're, we're all in this spectrum of, of human, the human experience. And so all of this, flying in space, flying aircraft, test flying aircraft, engineering new, uh, new materials, going to the moon, going on to Mars, all of these things are part of the human experience. And because we're all human, that we have access to all of these things. But I never realized that until many years later in my life. So if I could go back, as a great question, Will, because if I could go back uh, to your guy's age, you know, listening and even when I was a younger student, just a younger student to realize to just relax about the ordinary that you see in your own life, because I, gosh, I wonder if I'll ever achieve, you know, I, I have goals and dreams for my life too, but I'm, I'm, I'm stuck in this tiny little town or this tiny little school or my circumstances are tough to kind of, to understand that you're not alone. Um, and and that we all sort of emerge from those ordinary days, right? So we, um, and, to, and to see yourself, it's like, you know what? I can actually, I can actually prepare my life, prepare my study, uh, prepare my journey. I can prepare all along the way. There's, there's, there are things you could do every day of your life to advance your career goals. Uh, and your dreams and your aspirations for your life as well. There are concrete things you can do each day to kind of march toward those um, toward those goals. You know, I wish I could tell you when we finish today's session, you walk out the door of your of your home and or wherever you're sitting, and you say like, "I'm an engineer now," you know, and um, or I'm going to the moon or what have you. It's all part of it. But I want you to be able to say like, you know what? There's a path for me, and it comes through preparation. And so. I want to leave that with you that say, uh, you know, relax about the ordinary in your life, celebrate the ordinary that you feel in your life and uh, and know that all of these extraordinary things emerge from that very simple, very authentic and very humble um, uh, ordinary beginnings. And so uh, celebrate those and um, embrace the world around you. Wow, what a fantastic way to, to wrap up what has been uh, just a wonderful session. Can't thank you enough for your time, Colonel Wheelock. Um, I, I'm sure there are many others out there that enjoyed it as or as much or even more than, than I have. Um, but thank you so much once again for joining us. Um, if I could also say that we've got a number of other sessions happening at the conference that may be of interest, including uh, the session that's next up is the Sky the Limit with Bill Baker, the structural engineer behind the Burj Khalifa, the world's tallest building. We also have a networking area available uh, to meet some other students if you'd like to do that, um, as well as feel free to check out all of the other um, all of the other wonderful sessions that we've got lined up this weekend. But thank you so much for joining us and um, both students and of course, um, Colonel Wheelock and I uh, hope you enjoyed the rest of your weekends. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Will. I, w I, w I did want to leave with you one last thing. If, if there are lots of questions out there that you didn't get a chance to answer, you can find me on Twitter. I'm at Astro underscore wheels. Everybody calls me wheels at NASA, so I'll send that to you, Will, as well, um, that uh, Twitter handle to you. So if you have questions out there, uh, fire away on Twitter and I'll follow you and we'll, I'll, I'd love to follow your journey as you go on through your career, uh, reaching your goals in engineering as well. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Colonel Wheelock. Absolutely.